indeed a great uh, it's going to be a great day because we have got uh, wonderful speakers legends uh, we have done uh, so many things and we have proven all of us that uh, how great entrepreneurs they are and uh, they have been a true inspiration for all of us the coming generation the present generation and the past generation yes we have two wonderful speaker one is uh, dr nkj he is is known as captain nkj uh, nkj uh, nandakumar uh, jayaram sir sir we would like to give a very very warm welcome on behalf of nnf karnataka state chapter sir thank you thank you so much for having me and we have uh, second speaker dr ajay kumar he himself is a legend and uh, he has been uh, our uh, you know he, he doesn't need any introduction he is the hcg owner founder chairman and managing director a great entrepreneur a great visionary and we are very very proud that he has joined us today ajay sir on behalf of nnf karnataka state chapter we would like to give a warm welcome to you sir and uh, today's session will be moderated by our uh, uh, vice president beloved vice pres vice president founder chairman and a harvard graduate and the winner of so many awards uh, our own dr kishore kumar sir uh, the founder director of cloud9 group of hospitals he'll be moderating the session we would like to extend our welcome to you as well sir thank you thank you so we have other moderators as well will be uh, joining as a panelist one is dr sharad chandra dr suresh vishwanathan dr adarsh and dr satish ganta sir so we have been consistently sharing their views sharing their experience uh, in in most of the talks so this platform has been created to give a overall perspective for a doctor apart from their clinical skills what are the things which are important to to complete our 360 degree as a doctor in terms of you know being very successful along with the clinical uh, skills so today's topic uh, we have uh, two topics which we'll be discussing one on the what are the permissions which are required and we always get confused and every time there are new things which keeps on cropping up from the government side uh, so today we're going to discuss all those things and then doc doctor's perspective of designing an hospital that will be the another talk very interesting talk and our panelist and our speaker are going to shower their experience and share their experience uh, to with all of us so without wasting much of time i request uh, nanda kumar sir to start the session yeah. uh, before that i request kishore kumar sir to speak a few words and kotreshi sir to speak a few words and then we'll start the session what do you sir good evening everyone i am dr kishore kumar here uh, it is my pleasure to invite dr nanda kumar jayaram i know he is extremely busy but uh, with one request he agreed uh, to share his thoughts we uh, invited him because he has been a great visionary leader and uh, in so many achievements uh, he is a bangalore medical college graduate uh, both in uh, post graduation and under graduation subsequently in those years which was very difficult to go abroad he went abroad to uk and uh, specialized himself in colorectal surgery in st marks hospital in london subsequently he worked in mayo clinic in the us and he came back and he was an academician working in st johns and he also was the head of the department of st johns medical college hospital surgery and he was always very very keen and practicing quality issues he was a nabh assessor for quite a number of years he was nabh chairman from 2006 to 2018 he was a malya hospital head of the department from 1994 to 2006 subsequently when columbia asia hospitals uh, were being started in india they had hunted him and asked him to head the columbia asia hospitals in india if i can say that columbia hospital in india has succeeded only because of dr nanda kumar jayaram it's not a overstatement it's an understatement he practiced very quality qualitative surgery until 2017 when he stopped operating and uh, dedicated purely to administration he was given frcs by the royal college in 2017 he was also awarded healthcare uh, professional of the year in 2017 if i keep telling his achievements we need the whole day and uh, despite all these achievements he is quite humble honest and very hard working and it will be a great pleasure for us to listen to him with his experience about all the things and he has contributed immensely to the healthcare of india 
and uh, definitely uh, Karnataka in a very, very big way. Colombia Asia today stands paramount to the quality care they are providing in multi specialty hospitals. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, consent and agreeing to spend some time with us. Over to you, Dr. Karnanda Kumar Zairam. Thank you very much, uh, Kishore, for those nice words. I don't deserve all the credit that you've given me, but <coughs> <coughs> let me get along <coughs> with the representation because I know that Ajay, who follows me, is short of time, so I don't want to delay him. Basically, what I'm supposed to speak to all of you is on the licenses and other permissions that are required for us to run a hospital. On the face of it, this looks like a very simple and straightforward topic, but there are many ifs, buts, bends, and other aspects to this, which I'll try to outline over the next 20 minutes. And I'm happy to be able to be in your midst today and present on this topic. Statutory compliances in healthcare is not an option. One must understand that it is an absolute mandate and it is an indispensable part of uh, today's business. What is important for all of us to understand is that the lack of knowledge is not an excuse for us not to be able to understand what is required and law will not excuse you if you were to say, I did not know or I was not knowledgeable about this aspect. There is a proverb which says, a spark neglected burns the house. And I think all of us know the experience that was most unfortunate in Calcutta with the Ambry fire accident. Hundred people succumbed. Senior management, including the directors, had to face a prison term. And reputationally, the entire Imami group suffered enormously. And of course, the financial loss on account of this incident speaks for itself and explains how important it is to remain ahead and abreast of licenses. What are the good statutory compliances that one has to uh, follow? It is something that will enable you to you know, gain the trust of your employees, of your patients, that it will be a method by which banks and other prospective in, in, uh, investors will look at uh, helping you if you are statutorily compliant. On the other hand, if it is not, then as I said, there could be catastrophic repercussions as I have just mentioned. There may be reluctance of the investors and lenders, litigation and its expense, compensations and its expense, and prosecution of staff mm -hmm. and senior management, which is the most, most mm -hmm. unfortunate mm -hmm. situation that you can have. And all this can lead to a collapse of your business. Before we get into statutory compliance, it is worth understanding our constitution, which has a direct bearing on what we have to do. As all of us know, the Union of India is administered by the central government, and laws of the central government are applicable to the whole nation. States, on the other hand, are administered by state governments and state legislature are applicable only to that state. Why do I say this? I say this because the requirements of the state led legislatures will obviously be varied and not applicable across the nation. So depending on the state in which you work and practice, the laws may be modified to that extent, and you should be aware of this. And then, of course, you have the union territories. The Constitution also has a well-defined distribution of power between the union and the states. And the schedule to the Constitution lists out the subject matters which the Union of India can and the states can promulgate as law. The union list does not include health. Health, as many of you are aware, is a state subject. However, there is a catch to it, and, and I will explain that in the next slide. So you will find 
that whenever there is a uh, an, uh, uh, a matter that states would like to see spread across the nation, two or more states can, through Article 252 of the Constitution, promulgate a law, and then what happens is that law becomes binding on those two states and also other states which may agree to accept this law. Some in substance, although we are talking about uh, an act uh, which is by and large state moderated and health is a state moderated subject, there are certain aspects which are centrally dictated and the examples are shown below and the Karnataka Private Medical Establishments Act which many of us have gone through and suffered is one such. Now, what are the requirements that health establishment uh, have to follow? Let me classify this based upon the type of entity that is in the offering. So it would depend upon whether you have a charitable organization, a registrar of corporates, Reserve Bank of India, societies, etc. So depending upon the type of entity that you wish to start, the related registry would be then uh, uh, appropriately decided upon. Also, the size of the building, because the building plan sanction, commencement certificate, etc., etc., are based upon various things. For example, if you require an environmental clearance, then your building is usually more than six floors high. And if it is a you know, smaller building and not uh, with so many floors, it may not be required. So you will have to understand that and also depending upon the kind of service that you wish to deliver. A operations related to clinical establishment, MTP, organ transplant, etc etc are all part and parcel of the kind of clinical service that will define the licenses you need to obtain i mean obviously if you run a hospital that is based upon obstetrics and gynecology then you will not need anything to do with a transplant license and this is something that you will have to keep in mind and finally there are tax related uh, you know uh, statutory compliances that are important. So you can understand that there are various aspects that determine the kind of license or authorizations that you will require to uh, have. Now I have already outlined that these are important. And I draw your attention to point number three, which is on foreign direct investments. If you have a foreign direct investment, then whereas you need not have a license to do so, there are certain RBI regulations and there are certain entries in the RBI that have to be followed. I've already mentioned about the geographic position and depending on the states, you would have various requirement for licenses. Let me come to the 10 important points that determine what uh, are required in terms of licenses, out of which four has been explained. The fifth one is related to employees and you would require to ensure that you're in keeping with the Shops and Establishment Act, professional tax, etc., etc. Environment related, and these have become especially stringent of late, and one must be very careful in ensuring that you do not look any uh, look uh, away from any of these because that would adversely affect you. Any aspect that is radiologically related would require clearance from AERB, and that should also not be forgotten. And most importantly, is to remember that every license has a lifespan. And if you overlook this, then 
the expiry of the license and not having renewed it will have serious consequences. We are lucky in that there are certain licenses have, which have a lifetime validity and an example of that is your PAN card. Ranging between one to 10 years, there will be a need for us to renew licenses. Now, the list therefore, and uh, uh, I will show you how we classify these in subsequent slides, is quite easily seen and written down. What is important is the art of procurement. Is it easy to get a license? The answer is no. In our country, it is frustrating. And most importantly, I would say as follows. The first and most important point is to be compliant and not fudge information or data, which always leads to trouble at some point or the other. Number two, it is never a single window, single point, whatever is stated or said, multiple visits, follow ups, and some person who's appointed for this particular purpose, who is knowledgeable of the local language, who has the ability to speak well and with courtesy to the officer is extremely important. We have gained significantly in this way. All of you know that as a foreign uh, investment company, we cannot indulge in any of the practices that are out of the records. So we can't bribe to simply state. And that is a huge issue in our country in certain instances. But that has been overcome by the presence of a few people in the organization who are very, very capable of becoming friendly with the officers in a up straightforward way. And their repeated visits is what helps us to get these licenses done. And then there are certain people who simply will not, in spite of all that is appropriate, budge in getting a license. In that case, there are professional consultants. And we have engaged such professional consultants who have a better rapport with these people and enable them to grant these licenses to the organization. But obviously, that comes at a cost. So, there is always sometimes a tendency to say, it's okay, let us see, let us not really bother about this. When the time comes, we will look into it. Please do not do that. As I would say, the statutory compliance will come back and hit you if you don't have it, when it hurts the most. And that is something that I would impress upon every one of you. Now, if we look at starting a hospital, then we can split these into five phases of getting certification and the type of certification that is required. Phase one actually starts even before commencement of the building. And you can see that there are six clear clearances that are documented. And as I said, some of these are based upon the size of the building. And uh, it is worth understanding that creating this kind of uh, Excel with all the requirements for your particular building would be the first step even before you before you start planning for your hospital. The second which comes during or after the construction is towards uh, various clearances which may be overlapping with phase one. I draw your attention to fire. Before the building starts, there is a need for a fire NOC and afterwards in parallel with phase one will be a fire clearance certificate, which is something that is mandated and important uh, in all institutions. I want to draw your attention to the fire license. The fire license has a life. The fire license, in my opinion, is one of the most important 
and there have been various instances where old buildings do not have a fire license simply because they do not comply with the required norms. This is a dangerous situation and I would ask you to be very careful of this and ensure that it never deviates from this. Time and again, we've had incidences of fire in our nation with not just damage to property, but death of patients and medical staff, which is a huge issue. The other point that I would like to draw your attention to is discharge of wastewater and the creation of the STP, which is ever so important in our country. Now let us look at phase two in continuation. And one of the important aspects is to ensure electrical sanctions. And these are various documents that are there and would also be important both during and after the construction. As we com commence our operations, we require a trade license. And there is a very easy way of getting it, but without that, you cannot simply start a hospital. I also draw your attention to the cafe license and the pharmacy license, which can be extremely taxing. And the cafe license particularly, because if you have a cafe within the hospital, that has to have a separate license at all times. Once the building is completed, the biggest issue is getting a clearance and the occupancy certificate. And the occupancy certificate is something that has to happen anywhere and everywhere in the country and would be based upon certain visits, inspections and clearances. A lot of delay can happen if you don't get the occupancy certificate because the occupancy certificate and the opening of the hospitals are very close and failure to get an occupancy certificate will throw a spanner in the works and create a situation where you would have already employed people invested in equipment and every month you will have expenses which will pile on if you don't get your occupancy certificate because without that hospital cannot start. Therefore, it is important to time the occupancy certificate in such a way that you are ahead of the game and understand that if an occupancy certificate is to come within a month, it will take three times that amount of time and suitably ensuring that you keep that much of time for yourself is extremely important. And that is phase three of the certification and re regulation requirements. Phase four has got a whole lot of licenses with regard to pharmacy, with regard to restricted drugs, with regard to private medical establishments, and finally, the spirit license, which is because you are going to stock and store alcohol on the premises for clinical usage. So these can be listed as phase four, which usually starts after commencement, and many of these issues crop up in hospitals that have started running. I draw your attention to the narcotic drug license. Narcotic drug licenses are not issued until you have started operations, but you will need the narcotic drug from day one. And what is ideally done is that individual doctors can prescribe in their own name, and that is the only way to allow narcotics to be used until the license is procured. And then we have phase five, which are licenses of taxation, VAT, income tax, and so on. Now, of course, it has come down to GST, and there is a need for us to understand that these certificates will be, many of them would be from the income tax department, and some of them for uh, from 
the Pollution Control Board as well. It is wise to classify these licenses into these phases and decide when you have to start looking at these licenses for your hospital. As I stated, much of the example that I have given is towards the uh, Karnataka hospitals and there may be variations between Karnataka and let us say Uttar Pradesh because state laws can be slightly different. As we move on, there are other certificates which are HR related and these should not be forgotten. Firstly, I would say Provident Fund and ESI. These are important for your employees and following that is important. And what I would say is you can also maintain an Excel sheet to tell you when these are available and when they would be uh, expiring. If you do not maintain a, a sheet of when they are expiring, then you would find yourself in trouble. Also, please do not overlook certain certificates that are required for running of ambulances, insurance for vehicles, because these are sometimes overlooked once they expire. So like I said, you need to have a tracker. There are two ways in which these uh, trackers can be utilized. One is to have a tracker which is reviewed every six months by a specific person in the hospital to ensure that you do not overlook uh, any license that has expired. The second is to use a software tool which automatically throws up a reminder. The latter is much better because all said and done, manual intervention will never be able to be 100% sure, whereas a software generated reminder would be much better for you. My dear friends, the experience of running, starting and suffering through the licensing of 11 hospitals has taught us one thing. Be straightforward in obtaining licenses. Be timely in obtaining licenses. Understand when they are going to expire. Preempt these and sleep in peace. That is all I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the audience. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Hello? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Very, very comprehensive, and uh, you put it uh, simply. <clears throat> I wish it is as simple as that, but uh, you have mentioned all the uh, nitty gritties involved, which is very helpful. <clears throat> we are running short of time for Dr. Ajay Kumar, so we'll take his lecture first, and then we'll take the question and answer. So, to introduce Dr. Ajay, Dr. Ajay, have you joined? Yeah, yeah, I am on that. Welcome, Dr. Ajay Kumar, and uh, many of you know him as the chairman, CEO of Healthcare Global, which is the cancer uh, chain of hospitals. Ajay Kumar is a local uh, boy, like Dr. Nandakumar Jairam. He completed his MBBS from St. John's Medical College, Bangalore, went on to complete his residency training in oncology from University of Virginia Hospital in uh, Charlottesville in USA. He completed his fellowship in radiation and medical oncology from the University of Texas and Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. While he had opportunity to continue on practice uh, in the USA, he uh, decided um, to return to India to build a cancer care facility and uh, planned several months uh, uh, to start the hospital. And uh, he is a doctor printer and the chairman of uh, HCG Global Hospitals. And he has a radiation and medical oncology experience over 40 years. He's a true visionary. He has written his book. I'm sure many of you will uh, find interesting to read his experience. Uh, while he continued to build his practice in the US, uh, he Ajay Kumar founded a not-for-profit uh, hospital in Mysore called Bharat Hospital 
and Institute of Oncology in 1989. And uh, he has created uh, what anybody thought would be unbelievable and unachievable, which is the cancer care hospitals all around the country in the hub and spoke model. So he has experience of how to run the hospitals in a very big way. And he's also got experience of how to run a charitable um, uh, organization in a big way. And uh, he is a doctor, philanthropist. And if I keep on telling what all he has achieved, as uh, Dr. Nandakumar Jairam, I will need half a day to introduce him. So without much ado, uh, that's a brief introduction I can uh, justify giving him. And with that, uh, we will uh, go to his lecture. And uh, over to you, Ajay. Thank you very much, uh, Kishore, for those uh, kind words. <clears throat> and uh, and once again, thank you for having me. And when you um, call me, I know um, we discussed about this program and how I can uh, contribute to the way I look at uh, building up the hospital, my own journey. So if I can have the first slides, I can go through that. Before we start, I just want to say that a journey of an entrepreneur and doctor in understanding the nitty gritties of uh, starting the hospital. And we all say is doing one hospital is enough, but how do we do across multiple hospitals, comprehensive centers? It's always been a challenge. Uh, Kishore, can I see the slides? Um, Prashant, can you see the slides? Have uh, no, sir, no, sir. I think uh, I've not started sharing, sir. Yeah. I believe Girish sent that over. I don't know. No, no, I, I have uh, shared, but I don't know why it's not showing up. You can close and share one more time, sir. You can stop sharing and then start sharing again. Or else can we share? This is Girish here. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Girish. Yeah, I'm here, sir. I can share it also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Share it, share it. Okay, uh, Girish, I will tell you when to move the slides, okay? Yeah. So, as you said, I thought uh, <clears throat> after all the journey abroad in uh, US, uh, and um, next slide you can go through, abroad and then starting my own center. Can you see the slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you put it in slide mode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can While see, we can see. Opportunity to st uh, come, you know, st stay at MD Anderson. I thought I should learn the ropes of starting cancer center myself. That is how I practiced outside of Chicago for nearly 20 years, started the center there, learned the ropes. And one thing I felt very clear, uh, the reason I titled the book Excellence as No Borders is, doesn't matter whether you are a Indian American, where I immigrated to US in 1975. For me, it didn't matter. And when I saw how people came from 100 mile radius in a 100% white community, how I grew, I thought really if you're good in your work, it, it doesn't matter, everybody will come to you. And similarly, when I looked at cancer patients in India and there, I felt uh, that really cancer deserves the right treatment. Doesn't matter rich or poor. Cancer doesn't know who is rich or poor. All it knows is cancer. And it, and it deserves the right treatment. If you under treat because he's poor, the person is going to suffer more. So in the next few slides, I'll show you how that transformation should happen. And we have, we have made it happen. And how it is possible to make it happen. It is not an impossible task. So I always felt challenges are good, but challenges are can be achieved if with one single mind that I can do this. So with this, the pursuit, uh, you can go to the next slide, uh, uh, Girish. Here, I want to show the, the learning ropes was after become a doctor, we always want to practice uh, medicine in the best environment possible, do the best thing for the patient, their families, community. But you know, the opportunities may not be there, technology may not be there, infrastructure may not be there. And you know, we always in India, we always concerned about the cost to the patient. You know, suppose I want to do something right for a 20, 30 year old female patient with breast cancer who requires certain technology or drugs and the patient can't afford. Aishman doesn't pay. Morally, ethically, we know we want to do the right treatment, but the system says no, you know, she cannot afford. 
how do you bridge the gap how do you make it happen these are some of the challenges you face when you are a doctor and an entrepreneur and an administrator rather than you are just a pure administrator or a doctor for example a doctor may not face because the doctor can prescribe what is the right medicine they can always say you know what uh, they couldn't afford what could i do the administrator can say the doctor prescribed but the patient doesn't have the ability to pay what can i do but when you are both that is where i feel as a doctor you are you are there in charge i think you can facilitate you can make it happen because you are both sides you are on the both sides of the coin so this is how when we started first the bangalore institute of oncology together i realized you know we were in a very small phase place uh, and we realized this is not an oncology center it cannot be how can it be with very cobalt unit and we you know where we don't have necessary you know technology this was in 1988 and uh, i felt that while the world is looking at in uh, you know, a linear accelerator high technology at that time ct scan had come even mri was coming i felt that gap has to be bridged in fact uh, you know in the board meeting i was still abroad i was coming and going i was chairman in the board meeting whenever this issue came up that uh, why can't we do this we build a nice thing half the board opposed saying that we can't afford i said look cancer needs lina there is no question so we kind of bulldozed and bought the lina but the amazing thing was the first day we started lina 70% of the patient moved there in spite of the cost being three four times more expensive from 10000 rupees to 40000 rupees for the whole course so it was a clear uh, message to me and to the doctors really you know people prefer the right treatment people want the right treatment yes cost is a factor but the society needs the right treatment with that in mind i started working on how can i put together a plan between 1990 to 2003 i was still abroad but started working on can we create a center of excellence hub and spoke model can we use technology to bridge the gap with all this in 2003 next one you can go to see with odantri i started coming uh, moved to india convinced my family and based on my experience in md anderson you know the md anderson being a dedicated cancer center for me it was a game changer understanding how cancer infrastructure is needed how is it in a dedicated hospital you can do the right thing for the cancer patient and i'll go through some of the main points which i will later on describe in the slides but one of the important thing is you know we have to be a focused factory approach we cannot be in my view these are all personal views of course you cannot be it is like a multi cuisine restaurant you go to a restaurant you eat uh, masala dosa and you eat uh, you know gujarati food kichdi and you have uh, north indian food everything uh you know pak paneers and all that but can that be very good it can be okay average but it cannot be good whereas if you go to a, a paneer maker you are only make a masala dosa factory you know you know they are good you go to a pizza maker that is the approach i took if you want to really do you have to be a specialist in it you cannot be everything and say i will do a, do a good job in all this so i took a view in spite of a lot of opposition from investors saying will you succeed multi speciality can succeed but not an onco i said the infrastructure needed yes you will require large infrastructure you will require day care therapy centers you will require bunkers you know who is going to build a bunker how do you build bunker because as you know historically bunkers are always in the basement and people feel you have to go to basement cancer center in fact where i was practicing in near chicago was in the basement all the why is it it has to be in the basement do the cancer patient deserve basement so we proved it long our first center in bangalore linac uh, was on the ground floor we built a linac on the ground floor we did that now in several centers wherever is technically possible ms ramaya vijayawada everywhere we did on the ground floor we proved that you know it can be done that way the bunker need not be in the real bunker in the basement so that was one of the point the second is why do we have to put these patients on a bed do we need so many beds so we said let us do day care of course home care chemo can also be done but i felt uh, there's a little bit of a danger if they have a reaction so why don't we have 
one of the theories have floated is pump system. Can they go home? And then can patients be encouraged to teach their families to drive, come and take treatment, drive back? So that is the model we have created where there is an outpatient clinic, daycare therapies where patients come, take treatment, actually do their work. We give them a workplace. They can do their work on laptop and take a car, drive their car home. Is it possible to do? It is certainly possible. And more and more, one of the things I also learned, which I, you know, as times progressed, more and more, we want to treat cancer patients like any other individuals. They come as an outpatient, like you go to a dentist, you go to hair salon, you go to an outpatient cancer clinic, take your treatment and go to work. This is the model I always used to tell my patients, come on a Friday, back to work on a Monday. Why not? Saturday, Sunday, you rest and go. No need to abstain from work, nothing. Lead a normal life. So with this in mind, we move on to the next level. We showed that the next slide. Uh, I, and then we started with BIO, went on uh, to, as I said, you know, how can we improve the technology? As the technology improved, we have to keep up with the world of technology. We have to build necessary infrastructure. We have to have a, you know, we have a cyclotron for PET scan. We were the first pri private healthcare to put a cyclotron because I felt the cyclotron is needed for to do right things in the PET scan. If you, if you do a PET scan molecular imaging, it was very clear to me when I saw the first scan, uh, PET scan in 1990s in US, 2000, close to 2000, that this is the model for future diagnosis. It has to be molecular imaging. Why? Because the CT scan shows only the anatomy. The PET scan actually shows where the active disease is based on the SUV. This is where we have to go. So we spent a lot of time, energy. In fact, BARC, Dr. Nandakumar mentioned BARC, was very reluctant to give us approval for cy cyclotron in Bangalore, in the heart of the city. We had to put a lot of effort, bring experts from abroad to convince them the bunker is good enough to create this mini nuclear power plant, but it can be OK. It is safe. So that is how we convinced and put it in the heart of the city. And we are very happy indeed that it is working well for the last almost uh, uh, 17 years. And the PET scan, of course, we have moved on from PET to digital PET to show how technology advances and we have to advance. And one of the factors, you know, in a, in a hospital administration, as you all know, which comes is that, uh, you know, very clearly that, OK, you want to do all this. But where is the money? So we have to create models to make it capacity utilization. And one of the things when you procure equipment, and you know, I, I want to share this with my colleagues here, that it is, it is not that critical to pay everything up front. And it is also not critical to start paying the banks everything up front. You know, we came up with the concept of deferred payment. So for example, if you bring a linear accelerator, let us say at $2 million, and you have a deferred scheme where for three years you do not have to pay anything. It is built in. CMC is built in. So you expect that center in three years to generate enough income so it can self-sustain itself for that technology. If your plans are right, you will succeed. That is how, you know, partially we were able to do build about 14 centers in a matter of 10 years, eight years actually, from 2007 to 2014. We built about 14 centers, 14 Linux, CyberKnife, everything, PET scan, because obviously we didn't have that kind of funding, even though we had private equity funding, but we knew we can't do with only that, so we have to borrow, but we created a three-year deferred plan. That, I think, was one of the turning points for us. And people always wonder, one of the points is, why did you not continue with nonprofit hospital? I knew very well, you know, my DNA was never to go begging for any grants. When I did the Mysore Bharat Hospital, it was one of a kind. I fought for the land. I, you know, it was another story, which is, you know, in the book, but you know, for, a, for a fighting the system, not driving anyone. I ran the hospital for one year without electricity on a generator because I refused to bribe the electricity board at the time. So I think it was very critical that value system should not be compromised. People think it's easy to you know, bribe somebody, get license. I feel it is the path which is more important. 
So I, I'm very proud to say today, entire system we have, we have our HCG right in front of the city corporation without one rupee bribe to the city corporation. Of course, they have come many times and gone, but no. So what I want to say is I felt a non-profit hospital is a challenge because you know you have to go and ask for grants, government land and all. So entire HCG system is built without not one inch of land from the government, even the non-profit hospital. So I said, I, I cannot do more of this if I want to really make an impact across India because I traveled across India and seen people waiting for 10, 12 hours to get cobalt treatment. I said, I should use the hub and spoke model. Why hub and spoke model? The main center of excellence could have all the infrastructure, all the technology, virtual tumor boards can come there, all the 80, 90 oncologists there, so we can provide all the services from the main center to all these peripheral center. That is how we came up with the idea of establishing not just cancer centers, but comprehensive cancer centers in, the, in, the, in, the, in rural areas, like for example, Nasik, tier two, Angol, tier three city, Shumaga, tier three city, and in, uh, in uh, Hubli, uh, Gulbarga. So all of these 24 centers we have across the country, Gujarat, everywhere, where the idea was everybody needs accessibility. We need to have cancer centers comprehensive, not half-hearted, full comprehensive centers, full technology, PET scan, everything. At the same time, control from center so that the, the cost saving can happen, counseling can be done, and also shared services can happen. It was very important, shared services can happen. And one of the models we created, uh, as you will see here also, was not to put in too many beds. You know, initially we know we had beds like a Bangalore, our care hospital, main hospital has 300 beds. But as technology advanced, as knowledge about cancer went, as, as in any other field, more and more became a loss, average length of stay became less and less, and more outpatient, more therapy, outpatient, day therapy, home care. With that, what happened was transformation took place to an extent where we did not need that many pets. So the future hospitals we started building, whether it's in Baroda or Nagpur and all that, were 30 beds, 40 beds, 50, with all facilities, ICU, intensive care, everything, but more facility for outpatient, more lobbies, more patient counseling rooms, more uh, where patients can be spend time on their own. Can we have a meditation room? Can we do certain things which the patients and the family want? And the most important thing I felt, what does a patient require when they come? They require their own privacy. How do you create privacy? How do you give them room to reflect on what is the doctor telling about surgery? Can we use uh, you know, uh, technology for so the doctor can communicate with them, video conferencing within the hospital? So all of these things became important and more and more we encourage patients to out. You know, when I started the center in Bangalore, the concept of doctors were patient will like to come and lie down on a bed to take chemotherapy. Uh, when I started opposing it, major medical oncologists said the patient will run away. In fact, today, the state of the art is they want to sit on an easy chair, lazy boy, listen to music and take treatment. Nobody prefers a bed, very few. So the transformation has happened. This is the future. Now, when we, uh, when we go to the next slide, and I will just run through, you know, this is a worldwide in the next 10 minutes. Uh, you know, we also look at... Uh, who are the stakeholders? The more, most important thing is the stakeholders are patient centric, physicians, employees, insurance companies, pharma. But you know, we also have financial investors. But I always felt, you know, what is your EBITDA? What is your margin? What is your profitability? How many scans you did? Did you do right number of scans? Is one part should be the back back end part. Really, the front end is. Are we patient friendly? Is our you know lobby patient friendly? Are we is our staff with a smile receiving it? Are we make them welcome? Are we treating them as family? See, one of the important points I'll get across to the staff and the and the doctors is: Are we treating them as though she's my own mother, sister, brother, or father? Are we doing that? See, these are the important elements. Fundamental elements I feel in, in patients, uh, how do we receive the patient? If it is all about billing, 
if it is all about how much we made at the end of the day while it is important i don't think it will be a successful model maybe for a while but in the long run it unless it is patient centric unless we look at the outcome of the patient measure and publish and look at it i don't think long term it will be a credible institution next one uh next one uh, so again uh, again i always as i said before i think the specialty hospitals are very important because you know you can have a clinic on the floors suppose a pediatric clinic a kid comes playground there what we have sees the doctor in the clinic there and if it is admitted it is next door there only they get admitted this is how we have to look at the future and it is there here already now if bone marrow transplant next door the doctor can rush if there is an emergency so all of this is what is required in proper planning uh, not only we have to plan proper bunkers we have to plan proper lab access to lab can the doctors go and sit in the lab Uh, do research understand and look under the microscope can they then come and meet the patient families where are they going to meet the patient families where is the doctor what is the distance all of this has to and can we create a separate vertical can there be a medical oncology vertical surgical vertical radiation vertical so patients coming to different parts can go to different places is that a good idea these are all the discussions taking place as we speak so modern era as technology has put us on a different path altogether next one uh, uh, girish please i think uh, <clears throat> like and i always talk about singapore airport lot of you go to singapore been there what welcomes you to singapore is airport it's the airport tells you what is the nation phenomenal nation because the airport is so phenomenal so like that you know the entrance to the hospital the lobby the how you are treated not only the ambience but treatment how you look at it is what your hospital is about so it is very important can we all provide greenery can this be green can there be plants can there be people staff can there be how you are received with a smile how you are even discharged with a smile and what are what are you told sometimes what annoys me is when the patient is told you can't go until the billing is done because we don't know are all these the right words to say or should we uh, uh, trust them and say okay i will take care of it because these are all nitty gritties where you know i i even don't have answers but these are all things which which works in the patient mind our mind so we have to some day find right answers to those while we also try to survive next one <coughs> okay so you know virtual and the future is what future as i said you know i had my own experience with my son uh, who has muscular dystrophy he was in icu and what happened to him how we brought him home and we published in british medical journal how one can manage intensive care at home so i think future is most of the care will be empty park lots parking lots home therapy virtual hospitals and my dream for future honestly my fellow doctors is that we should not have any very minimal in patients maybe surgery they got the targeted surgery they go and we should be able to through technology cameras manage these patients at home look at what happens to their infection rate look at the patient service look at the comfort to the patients and if something goes wrong they are at the home only not anywhere else and the outcome possibly will be better can we do rounds virtual rounds like we are doing for covid patients like you know i did on my son where you know through through cloud physicians we were able to manage when we even when we went into septic shock uh, you know in fact at one point when his blood pressure was 60 by 0 uh, and we thought and he had a renal failure the cloud physician said we have to move him to the hospital now i said no and because i knew he cannot tolerate infection so we pulled him out of that maybe i took a risk and uh, and this is the presentation uh, we did at the british medical journal clearly you know there is a great opportunity for us without any financial compromise to do things away from the hospital this is virtual imagine a like a star track you have a main area where all the doctors are sitting making rounds on patients virtually we are seeing patients we beam in to the patient and say how are you doing without physically being there and exam do the whatever you know uh, things can be done and the nurse is there 
and we are we give these particular orders and we come back to our main center virtually and start looking at next patient from i think we can see patients in rajaji nagar ashwantpur or uh, jai nagar everywhere by making virtual note without going there and this is honestly i feel is where the future is headed as technology advances we are going to use technology and correct it and bring it up to leverage for the patient's use and uh, and then i think uh, patients will have less infection look at the covid period we are seeing less infection our mortality rate is down by 50% because you know uh, people are taking precautions hand washing you know masks distancing all of that has helped even our non covid patients a lot our oncology patients i mean so this is where we are headed in future uh, uh, uh girish we have any more few slides i think we have i will uh, girish so i think uh, i also believe you know as uh, colleagues entrepreneurs doctors we should not worry about failure we should sometimes welcome failure as long as we are willing to learn that has been my journey there are a lot of failures a lot of incidents where i feel i made wrong decisions but i think we we'll learn from it and the most important part is learning and you can be to both places on the left and right by by doing this i think uh, shri the shri the uh, girish if there is any more i can cut short quickly in the interest of time can you show me any more slides we have i think hope knowledge we all know about hcg i don't want to talk much about hcg next one please and this is the journey which uh, i have undertaken from 1975 to today how we have created uh, in spite of lot of sex skepticism one word on the quality and outcome it's very important to know that what you are doing is right that is why you know harvard business school came and did study five years in a row case study review showed that we can get the same outcome in breast cancer we got equal to best of centers in us at 1/8 the cost 2900 in india at that time to 22000 dollars in us at that time in 2013 14 so it is clear and uh, you know then the ifc did a study through the amsterdam independent group showing that experience quality of care in india in hcg was higher than the global competitors including national health services of england so we can achieve we cannot say really we are a poor country we can't do i think that is not true i think every patient you know why not we treat a cyber knife for a kid at 12 o'clock in the night free of charge if that is what the kid requires why should we refuse similarly if somebody needs treatment why not we do crowd funding and make sure they get the right treatment foundation so there are various ways to skin the cat as they say i think uh, there is no dearth of opportunities there are people who are willing to pay cross subsidy is the key for hcg success people who are willing to pay have to pay when an nri comes and says i cannot pay it is wrong and when when if somebody who is a poor farmer comes and says i want to sell my farm please do i think that is wrong also so the right thing is the affording person should pay on affording we have to bridge the gap and fortunately or unfortunately universal health care has not come and all these schemes are not helping us but we need universal health care i know nand kumar we are all worked on that to see how to bring but there are some stumbling blocks but i propose a universal health care where everybody contributes based on their on their capacity is the answer today we spend only 83 dollars per person in india united states spends 9400 dollars per person entire europe spends average of 5000 dollars we are saying we are spending 83 dollars including you uh, know private uh, public everything and say we want the same care as 9400 dollars you to i leave it to your imagination but we all as doctors should pat ourselves on the back because we are the cheapest healthcare provider in the world nobody to beat us our quality and data is improving as we improve and show our data like what to the harvard business school others we can become pioneers and leaders in this so called value based medicine my friends that is what we can achieve we have a enormous opportunity to do that and i hope you know this is some food for thought to see how we can achieve this goal great infrastructure great technology great doctors indian doctors are everywhere as you know you know you go to new york you are indian doctors you go to harvard you are indian doctors you go to boston one of the finance minister of uh, tanzania told me he went all over there harvey street and finally he came to us saying i'll come to the land of indian doctors and take treatment so we are brilliant we are bright we are very capable 
and now we have capacity to build the infrastructure and make it happen provided systems like government doesn't come in the way that is a talk for some other day so with this i will conclude my talk and thanks for listening to me ajay thank you very much for such wonderful inspirational talk uh, i'm sure there will be a lot of questions will you be back uh, after how many minutes uh... no i think my call will be long time i can answer few questions now if there are you know okay. in the next 5 minutes or 10 minutes okay prashant i think we'll yes, take uh, questions for ajay kumar first and then uh, nand kumar jayaram later because he has sorry no about this I, i i couldn't change that call at 6:15 yeah. thank you dinakar sir dinakar sir hello hello yeah prashant yeah kodrish uh, sir you have hello, some one last my my clarification yes, to dr ajay please yes sir uh, one one uh, can you hear yes yeah. sir yes sir go ahead sir sir, sir you just now said if government of india feasible to support our your uh, modalities or uh, things how the uh, indian doctors can set up a, a wonderful uh, institution for hospital for all the cares what are what are the uh, what are the leniency to be given from the government itself see Because, doctor uh, government has never come forward even in the covid period i'm sorry you know we are all in various associations even in the covid period they have helped miners they have helped uh, coal miners they have helped a uh, uh, lot of other industries but what is the stimulus they have given to health private healthcare please tell me zero when i raise this question you know they tell me please don't ask us money when yeah. nursing homes hospitals are suffering they are not even able to pay salaries doctor what is they have not given 1 rupee even the money they owe through schemes they are saying they may not delay they may delay you know, given though they have given some so i think the attitude of the government is very socialistic in when it comes to private health care they think either the government should do or we are walking out with bags of money boat loads of money so they are not understanding our difficulties and what great service we have done to the society you go to tier 2 tier 3 cities where i you know you all travel i travel nursing homes are the ones doctors families are really the social service provider you know people don't even pay them they say give me some vegetables it's okay historically that is how we have done we have been friends of the people but you know unfortunately the system has not recognized i don't know who to blame we maybe we have to take some blame ourselves some to the way the media is portrayed you know whenever you see media is like we are squeezing what are we squeezing <laughs> you know so these are some of the issues which has to be addressed for that we need unity if we don't have national unity i don't think we can win the war but i would like to say if the system should be corrected rather than anything absolutely system should be corrected but we have to do it through because in us and all look there is a lobby they control the member of parliament they control the members uh, ministers they say lobby we don't have a strong lobby system because all we are all divided we are too independent we are through entrepreneurial <laughs> that is the issue you know? <laughs> nice thank you very good words you said <clears throat> i think you hit the nail on the coffin ajay we are too independent and too divided uh, to be unified i think uh, whatever the issue is we are never united unlike uh, lawyers in india no nobody can touch the lawyers for whatever reason if the same thing were to happen doctors we are not united absolutely it's unfortunate but it's true we don't have a union <laughs> union type you know we don't have <laughs> that is the issue unions are there but they are, they are not individual opinions are individual they they are not taking decisions collectively correct correct sir i have some few questions uh number one sir when you came to india we, you know that cancer treatment will be little more expensive as you told in your class you have charged almost the double than the what is available that present time but what made you to invest like pet scan so much equipments what made you or what is the gut feeling in you because you are telling i went to us i i was there in us once again i saw some scanning machine there pet scanning and molecular study but i thought i should have it in my hospital in india i know that it will be double triple four times expensive how you arranged even if you would have arranged through the bank 
what made you you can re replace that what is that gut feeling you had because you are a successful uh, both entrepreneur entrepreneur and you are a good owner and you are running with a, whatever the hub spoke model or multiple brands you have success many people but at that beginning what made you no i think uh... <laughs> as i said before having trained as an oncologist my one mantra was do right thing for the patient you have to and if you want to do right thing you have to have pet scan you have to have linear accelerators you know it doesn't matter where the person is from you have to have right technology right doctors so then the cost factor comes i said i have to create innovative model that was what the harvard study was this subbent spoke the model of uh, deferred payment i for siemens for example i went to the board of siemens in uh, germany said i want to do this uh, technology to all levels so they said what do you want i need from you without any bank without any guarantee i want 10 million dollars they gave me 8 million dollars payment with a low no, with very low interest over a period of time so no bank was involved with that i started you know i had to do a lot of talking of course convincing <laughs> and whenever people said private equity and i want 20% 25% return i said no that is not possible i don't know i used to walk out see you also have to be honest with anybody and you know even with the banks i used to say look you give me lc but i cannot uh, pay for this lc it has to be done another way so in a very transparent way in fact when azim prem ji came to invest with me in 2007 i didn't know he asked me i didn't need money i had formed my first branch but i couldn't refuse he said why are you why do you want to do he said because of your transparency in ethics i want to but remember i want to be in healthcare but i want my returns he said <laughs> i want my returns so i know i think it, and i gave him his return he got his two and a half times his uh, investment and left so all i want to say is you have to be at the end of the day uh, truthful to yourself as we all know and we also have to make sure when others invest money or bank their money is more valuable than yours obviously it is and that is how you have to protect their wealth and make sure i have given five exits to pes and now we have a new funding of 650 crores now i have to look at public market because that is my problem but in the in the long run in answer to your question either you do the right way or don't do don't compromise i think that is it and you create a model so that it is becomes viable okay sir very nice what you told the last word don't compromise because if you do, if you no no that was my thing very nice sir it was really inspirational talk excellent thank you, thank you very much up to you sir so kishore can i take leave now you are on mute prashant, yes, sir. you are on uh, mute yeah prashant Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ajay, for taking time and. Uh, any time, any I'm sure time. Sure, you will be an inspiration for many juniors now who have been listening to you. Uh, you have been an inspiration for many people so far. You too, But Kishore. You are all done great things. All of you have done. I know <laughs> Kishore, Nanda Kumar. Everyone have done lot of contribution. And I think I want to start a school for entrepreneurship. I'm working with one group. I will come to you, Nanda Kumar, and all the doctors. How we can really mentor and create the future entrepreneurs, as we said, absolutely, doctors. Absolutely. We have to get united. I think the uh, we have to get united. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. I agree. I think we have to do uh, entrepreneurship and leadership for all the healthcare okay. professionals. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. On behalf of NF Karnataka, Kudreshi, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, President, sir. Very nice, sir. I would like to say a word about this program. Uh, in in web series, we have done a lot of scientific uh, programs, but this is the first time I am proud to say I am the president of this Karnataka NNM. The entrepreneurs and uh, social service and investors have become a one platform for NNM, so they can give the ideas, including uh, how to come up the things, how to keep the records, how to come up the things. So all the uh, all the moderators also have done the wonderful job on this one. Uh, with with all the activities, NNF is proud to say involve all these activities. Sir, can I ask some questions to uh, Sir Nanda Kumar, sir? Yes, sir. Go, go ahead, please go ahead, Dr. Nanda Kumar Jairam. Yes, yeah, sure, please. Sir, you told 
OC is very must uh, to start everything. I heard that some things and all they have cancelled. Now because of the COVID season to start an hospital, I heard that some revisation they have done. Can you just throw a light on that, sir? This is my first question. I have four or five questions, sir. Please, if you don't mind. About yes, this. So the only license that they have done away with is the trade license. But other yes. things are uh, still required and we have to abide by that. And OC definitely is required before you start your operations. OK, so number one. Number two, suppose, sir, everybody is having their own hiccups in the buildings. I know that, sir, you are very strict, but just let us say in a broad way. I am not. Please don't think like a military, sir. Think it in a broad way. Everybody will have some deviations either in the building plan or in the four plan or the what is it floor plans and whatever it is. So even after adjustment, you know, according to the requirement, they will sign it. Do they will sign in the what is it uh, OC paper or plan paper? Suppose if anybody has constructed some ICUs on that other floor or anything, it is not so fifth floor maximum three floors are allowed, four floors are allowed. Don't think only corporate or in the city or metros in other floors. If they would have started their own, do you think later they will face any problem once hospital is established? So this is a, a question that can be answered in two ways. One, if there is no catastrophe if there is no accident in the hospital you may get away with it but can any one of us predict that that is the case no so the other thing is to allow that to be rectified in the sense you can ask them to accept certain modifications in the building over a period of time pay for the additional floor and get it corrected and that is much better. I will tell you this. Sir. Uh, it is not that every single inch of Columbia Asia is done as per what norms the government asks. But if there is a deviation, the deviation is such that it can be condoned. So you should not deviate in a manner that cannot be condoned. That is definitely risky. So I would say that, you know, additional floors, floors without license, these are risky. We should not get into it. And at the time of planning itself, you should know what the BBMP will condone and what it will not. Yes, sir. Sir, and uh, one more thing you are telling, but because we heard that there is agencies. If we will pay them money, provided if we will give the floor plan and all those things and uh, all the around 13 or 40, whatever you are telling, sir, there are so many permissions. Do you think that agencies work with if you will pay the money, they will get all the things and come to us and give us? Is it true? No, sir. There is no single agency that will get you all the licenses. And I don't think you maximum should... maximum. Yeah, if... So if for one particular agency, I mean authority, there will be a specific uh, agency that will do it. For example, for pollution board. All the licenses of the pollution board, there will be somebody who is willing to do it. All the licenses of the corporation, there will be another person. And I am not saying that you should go to them for all licenses. For example, trade license is simple and straightforward. Anybody can apply for it and get it without any hassles. So it is only those where you face a roadblock, where you feel that the officers are such that they are not going to be conducive to you, that you should approach such agencies. And that is the way we have functioned. OK. So if it is so, if it is so, some floors are like a canteen and they have done something, but fire fellow has given all the permissions for all the floors. So it is a discrepancy between the each departments what they will give permission. So okay. what should we do, sir? No, no, no. Actually, if you ask for license to run a cafe, they are not going to look at the size of the cafe and all this. It is just that that you are licensed to serve food and refreshments within the premises of the hospital. That is all. So the re requirements are only occupation certificate and fire license for building specification. <clears throat> Sir, is what you mean cafe is a canteen or just a coffee and a 
or can't uh, what is that uh, just as a uh, refresher is uh, like a simple coffee and bakery items is that that also need permission or canteen itself is a different cafeteria what do you mean sir permission means so i will give you the example of our i will give you the example of in our hospital we have got we have got and we have to get a license and if you look at uh, we have a, on the ground floor a small outlet which sells coffee and some snacks that we have to have a separate license the only way only way you can get away if you want one license is to show that as an extension of the canteen which they will sometimes permit sometimes not oh. very nice sir and one more thing regarding the biomedical waste or sewage waste permission we know that labor room ot and the lab that whatever the sewage water is coming so we should treat and we should leave it so do you think other all the hospital we can leave directly no sir no all outflow from the hospital should go to stp and then be discharged for a, is there stp is recommended for 50 and less bed hospital or more than anything else like that rules is there sir no sir no you have to have stp based on the water consumption anticipated water consumption based on the anticipated water consumption because i have gone through many hospitals many hospitals none of the people are having stp in their premises just they are giving treating the water of the lab and the labor room and the ot whatever they get so other than that none of the people are having stp in their 60 40 or 100 100 sites they don't have how they are running and no no so as i said if it is perhaps that the quantum of water discharged from them is lower than what is required for an stp you can just treat it and send it then okay sir sir any other questions from your side sir no thank you prashant yeah sir one question i have received now uh, so before we start an hospital to apply for all these licenses what should be the ideal time kept or can we do it simultaneously with the building or with the interiors what is your advice sir so phase 1 as i said should start before the commencement of construction all others will be parallel okay uh, so if any of our uh, uh, delegates attendees have a question they can unmute themselves and they can ask one by one um, meanwhile we have other panelists as well uh, who has joined dr suresh dr sadish ganta dr sarath chandra and dr adarsh so and with uh, nkj sir uh, if if any of you have any question you can directly unmute and you can ask uh, hello yeah i am dr nitin agarwal from baroda baroda yeah my question to the sure. nkj sir can uh, no, sir health care industry is included in msme is there any advantage in getting softer loans from the msme ministry for establishing a hospital not really uh, you know the msme uh, advantage is not uh, very uh, useful as far as hospitals are concerned we have checked on that okay thank you any of the delegates attendees if they have any question they can unmute one by one and they can ask meanwhile i request dr suresh uh, to uh, put his views on uh, today's topic dr suresh yes i'm here uh, thanks prashant uh, it is interesting that we are talking about the statutory requirements and i agree 100% that uh, what are statutory requirements that have to be uh, complied with otherwise tomorrow you never know what is going to happen no new covid is going to happen but i have a uh, i mean one of the concerns here is in india a lot of hospitals have been started in the last 20 30 years hospitals like mine which are more than 30 years old and which at that time the rules were not so strict or even in tamil nadu for example till last year they did not insist on building occupancy certificate 
Now, what's happening is now with NABH and all the newer norms, older hospitals are facing a very tough time uh, complying with the requirements. We have, for example, we have a fire in OC. Yes, uh, we put uh, all that has been done. But if you look at the strict thing as per NABH, uh, for example, lift license. Lift license is not possible without NO, uh, BOC. And BOC, because there are some deviations in the past, like this, there are issues like that. So, uh, if anyone could comment on that. Great. Uh, I think I can take the liberty of answering. Uh, you're absolutely right. In the past, uh, people could have converted one house into a nursing home and started anything, and there were no norms. Basically, we call it as a mother, mom, and dad nursing home. Now, uh, standards are being regularized. I think. Uh, we have the right person to ask such questions because Dr. NKJ has been the chairman of NABA accreditation. And the reason for accreditation and standards is to improve the healthcare standards in the country. Probably, NKJ, you want to uh, add? Uh, yeah. So, I, I, no, you're right. There are issues when you have an older hospital, no doubt about it. But what I would say is that. Uh, even NAPH is cognizant of this and has tried to help out. For example, in with regard to fire license, fire license, you cannot get a fire license. The fact that you have to do the fire will serve the purpose. Also, private fire. Help out in this way. I would request all the others to please mute because otherwise, whatever is spoken is cannot be heard. So, what I'm saying is I, that there are certain areas uh, where you can look at other alternatives for NABH. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. I wanted to bring this up because this is a common concern. And quite often you also see a lot of new hospitals coming up where they take a couple, lease a commercial complex and convert it into a hospital. And right. uh, they face these issues. So uh, people should be aware even before like leasing a, a building that has not been built for a hospital to see if they can meet the statutory and other licensing uh, requirements. Sure. Sir, one more question. Uh, uh, suppose if we are uh, taking care of the entire hospital setup as a owner or a founder, uh, how to balance our clinical skills as a doctor, managing uh, director of the institution with, you know, getting into all this license? What is your advice for people? How to go about? Should we cut off everything and stick to one administrative skill or uh, should we balance both? No, no, I think it is possible to balance both. There is no question. Uh, as I have said, uh, I, I have been a practicing surgeon for a good part of my career and I combined the two. The only point that you must remember is not to compromise either. When you are an administrator and a clinical person, there are three things that come in, uh, in force. One, time. You have to devote time to both. Number two, standards it is possible for you to apply quality to both without any compromise and the third is to understand about costs and how they are. because as a clinician you will be always softer towards the patient as an administrator you tend to be much more financially oriented so these three points need to be addressed but i think a very very unbiased view has to be taken and you can never you need not compromise either Sir, one more question, sir. So, if you are planning for an 100 to 150 bedded hospital, uh, what should be the budget should be allocated for license uh, thing? What what should be the percentage of budget we need to allocate? Oh, I don't have a figure offhand because we have spent monies at various points in time, but uh, it is not much. That much I will tell you. Even if you have to pay the consultants, it is not much. Uh, uh, honestly, I don't have a figure, but I can probably look at it and come back to you with a suitable number to it. 
Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I request uh, any of our delegates, if they have any doubts, they can unmute one by one. And if one person is speaking, we request all the delegates to be mute. Keep yourself muted. Anyone has a question? Dr. Naresh Prasad? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, my uh, request was uh, the MD medicine people are getting a license to uh, run an ultrasound machine and uh, the MD pediatricians, why we are not allowed to run an ultrasound machine and uh, we, that is more needed by us and uh, if, it, if it is allowed, it will definitely will be, uh, it can bring a good change in our medical practice or pediatric practice. Even in neonatology also, sir. By listening to the various speakers about the echocardiography, ultrasonography, we are learning something. But once we don't have at bedside the ultrasound machine, we are not able to diagnose it very quickly and tell the prognosis of the patient to the attendants. That was the issue. Shall I take that? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Sir. Okay. So. I want to say that this is also dependent on uh, the interpretation of the PCPA PNDT Act by various states. For example, in our hospital in Patiala, the echo machine cannot be moved, which is such a terrible thing. There is a location that has been fixed for the echo machine and it has to be there only. So how can you function? All of us understand that an echo machine will have to be a bedside investigation when a patient is very sick. So this is unfortunate, but I think there are certain things which are being worked out and it is a little premature for me to say this, but I know the government is looking at it and things may change in the near future. Can I ask Dr. Uh, Shar Can I ask yes, Dr. Sharat Chandra? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sharat Chandra is there? Are Satish Krishna, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Sadish is there, sir. Go ahead, sir. He can hear? Yes, yes, I can hear. Sadish, uh, Kanta, please, can you just tell us about, we heard from uh, sir in detail, even uh, from Suresh was discussing very nicely. So just, I want, because you are a partner of the hospital, I know that we know the all the permissions are needed. Can you just tell, because some people, what I heard, little difference is there from what Sarah has told. So what anybody can, because many people are there, at least 25 people are interested to open a hospital. What Sarah has told is a main thing. It is the means it is a blood or a thing for the body. Can you explain to us? See, I mean, the most important thing is, let us say, permissions. Let us take the example of a fire. Okay, so you need fire NOC and let us be very, very clear. In India, you know, anybody can be bought and X number of, uh, you know, bribes can be given and you can get, you know, a fire NOC about four or five years back. Yes, now I understand that it's a lot more strict. But as sir said, I agree that we have to go by the book because he used one phrase when he said, can you guarantee that nothing is going to happen down the line? See, I'll tell you a recent example which happened in Vijayawada. Okay, it's a big hospital and he's been practicing for close to 35, 40 years. And he has taken that out for lease and there's a fire that happened there. And unfortunately, it was with the COVID patients and all the media's attention is there. You know what the government has done despite 35 to 40 years of experience they have issued him an arrest, arrest warrant. Nobody will save us, sir. When things go wrong, when things unfortunately, you know, when there is a fire accident or any of these things, absolutely nobody will spare us. Whatever amount, how, how much ever amount of deep connections you have or whatever, at that time, the public impulse is against the hospital and there is a fire. So nobody, nobody can save us. So I think... Keeping all that in, in the best possible view, it is important that we stick to the regulations and get a fire NOC if it is 15 meters above or whatever. So that is one thing. Second, let me take an example of your uh, STP plant. STP plant, if they want to trouble you, they can trouble you XYZ. There is no doubt about that. 
for us in hyderabad how is, what is the policy right now even if you have a 20 bedded hospital you have to have an stp even if you tell them that the space is not much they have made provisions you know in different different ways so they are you know they, you are forced to have an stp so every single department's waste has to be uh, sort of treated and then sent so you know every single thing whether it is you know whether it is fire or stp or you know sewage or uh, biomedical waste so i know i understand that it is difficult to get the things with the stipulated time especially if you are taking a leased out building but as one of the um, you know um, one of the speakers have pointed out even if you are wanting to take a leased out premises before we take this leased out premises it is better actually to have somebody you know visit the place and find out whether we can get all the approvals or not so temporarily you might have gotten over it and you would have sort of bribed somebody and you know started off the facility but if shit happens if thing bad things happen trust me nobody will sort of help you you know i've seen two instances in the last 6 months where the doctors have been sitting in jail and you know even though they are influential you can't help it so i think there is no excuse out here i hope i have answered uh, yeah 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 i think satish has uh, hit the nail on the coffin that is one thing if it goes something wrong nobody will save you yes. the other thing is if you don't follow regulations you are subject to exploitation exactly every yeah. month they will come and say your uh, rules have been violated bribe me this much bribe me that much so the more popular you become over the years the more subject to exploitation so it's better to be following the rules from day one so that nobody can exploit you that's a basic principle so when you start you think that you may not be famous that much but once you become famous you will have to pay the price if you don't follow the rules and regulations sir uh, can i say i may have to leave in the next 5 minutes so if that's okay with the sir. yes sir sir, sir, sir. can i say one thing Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Sir, doctor. Say, go ahead. Yeah, in the most of the places, even the private clinics, in the doctor's uh, house also, and the hospitals also, we are not caring about the electrical devices, electrical switchboards, and many things which are very uh, essential. In one of the hospitals at our place, what happened? There was a leak from the generator, and the the lady got the shock from the generator current, and she died. And there was nobody to care. care about uh, uh, to her since the generator was lying at the back part of the hospital and anywhere they tried their level best but we, they were not able to save even uh, if the mobile chargers are there it is connected to the plug and the other end is open one of the child got the electric shock from the other end of the mobile charger plug and uh, anyway the child was saved and this is the common phenomenon which is taking place in various nursing home and even the houses and in the many dead times we make a temporary solution to the electrical problems and they are not <clears throat> not put, putting a proper way how to save the electric uh, leaks and electric uh, equipments electric switchboards and they are not uh, how to uh, uh, stop the fire from the electric currents so that is also a big issue it should be taken very seriously to prevent any uh, harmful effect upon us thank you <clears throat> sorry to interrupt uh, i think uh, we should thank dr nandakumar jayaram for having taken uh, time out and uh, having come to explain to us as you can see he has a vast experience of uh, being a surgeon doctor ceo managing director chairman accreditation quality we all talk about it he has achieved all that and he has been a truly uh, symbolic of uh, what anybody can uh, do with their um, per <coughs> persistence perseverance and patience if you put your mind to action thank you very much sir really appreciate you having educated uh, all our audience regarding uh, new senses which can happen and uh, the rules we need to follow and we really uh, sincerely thank you dr kotresha you want to say a few words please uh, 
Uh, I am really also in how to say and the present of Karnataka India. In my venture, with all your support, uh, the Secretary Basham, Vice President Dr. Kishore, and our uh, very eminent uh, President Dr. Dinikar, we are doing the very good activities on this uh, subject, uh, including EB members, everybody is supporting. Uh, the thing is, uh, series of things are happening like this. Ultimately, what is what is my message you see? There should be improvement of health care in Karnataka. Say we, we, we could be able to bring the moderate to zero level. That is my view. And I once again thank for all the our team of the members who get done uh, doing well, very good jobs on these uh, presentations and as well as the impression and as well as encouraging the, our uh, dynamic uh, neurologists to come out. Places of situation in COVID area. Nice, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, if, sir, if, ah, Prashant. If, yes, sir. If you have got any questions from your side, uh, you can put it across okay. with our panelists. Or else, okay. we'll. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Suresh? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Suresh, you are there. Very nice. Now, Suresh, why I am asking is some people might be because all these things are recorded. They will uh, go and see because there are so many people. They have messaged me, sir. Today is my duty. Stood, sir, I have opened, sir, my final year DM, and I am planning to open, sir. My wife is gynecologist because, sir, I am opening in the periphery. Like that, many people have just calling and sent a message. That is the reason I'll take. Just two questions for you, two questions for Ganta. And uh, uh, any other uh, people are there, uh, Dr. Uh, Prashant? Sir. Other than these two people, any other people are there? Dr. Adarsh was there. He had uh, okay. told the meeting. Sir, he's not Okay, there. anyhow, Dr. Kishore is there. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, sorry. Uh, number one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Suresh, tell me, I know that you have started, it is a long history of hospital. History is there. Do you think till now also you are facing any problems with the permissions on and off? The more successful you are facing, In which way you are facing the problems? No, the more successful you are, the more trouble you have. First thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, uh, uh, like I say, pollution control board, electricity. They, I mean, if you're like I said, uh, already they're established. They, uh, then it, you're a target. But at the same time, because you're established, it is easy that you can call the right people and get things done moving faster. Practically, I'm saying. I mean, uh, if the file is stalled, you can go all the way up to the corporation commissioner or collector and get yeah. things moving. So that benefit is there. But statutory requirement uh, troubles continue however long you've been in um, practice. Okay. So once all the permissions you will get legally, still do you think you will have some problem? Yes, because like uh, Dr. N.K. Jairam said, all these licenses have a definite finite validity. Three years, five years, two years. So when you go back for renewal, it's the same process. They're always, uh, I mean, either you uh, engage a consultant to get things, uh, get the file moving, or you directly deal with them. So uh, that's why none of these licenses, are, except for your building approval and uh, probably one or two things, everything else has to be renewed periodically. Okay, number one. So, because fire and all, do you think that is also renewal? Fire is renewal, yes, biomedical is renewable. renewable. And the other side effect of having all these licenses is they all come to you for free treatment, but when it, when you go to them for a favor, you <laughs> you're still on the dock. Yeah, that is there. So, Dr. Satish Kanta, sir, are you here? I'm here. I'm here. Uh, uh, sir, you tell me what is your experience about the permissions. Yeah, you told already. Is there any other thing you want to tell us? Yeah, I mean, one, two things. What you could do is uh, uh, 
I mean, actually, we are actually trying to have that uh, uh, HIMS software. Yeah. What you could do, all these permissions, if you could have all the dates, the expiry dates of all these things plugged into the system, that will give you an alert when it has to be renewed. Because that is one thing we always forget the dates. And as, I, as the other speakers are also were pointing out, the most important thing is if everything is smooth, nobody will bother you. If something happens like an accident, everybody will just pounce. They'll just wait to pounce on you because, you know, the media is already there. So I think for me, the best thing is you can have a software which actually alerts you. That is actually called the BMS, Building Management System, where, you know, you have everything in the system where all of them you will get alerts when this is about to be uh, fulfilled. You know, one month prior to the expiry date, it has to be done. So that is uh, one thing. Secondly, if you are starting, it is actually a good idea to engage the services of a NABH consultants. See, many of the NABH inspectors, you know, people who can, they can apply to be an inspector, they could be a doctor or could be some other services. They've actually started so many NABH sort of consultations, right? Yeah. So these NABH, NABH consultants or NABH inspectors, if you employ them right in the beginning, they might not help you with the permissions, but at least they will tell you what are the things that need to be going. You know, this is the plan. What are the possible places where you can get a rejection? How, you know, what are the things? I think that is a good way to go forward. Do you agree with me, sir? Yes. So that is, so that is the other thing having this thing. Now, the third thing I really want to stress, especially with the COVID crisis now, all the exhaust guidelines are changed. Every exhaust guidelines are changed with the COVID. Now, first, if you remember, what did the WHO say? I said, please switch off the air conditioning system. And the catastrophe happened. In fact, many doctors died because they started switching off the air conditioning system. And in that hot, humid condition, you know, it actually spread more. The COVID spread more. So then they said, no, no, you can't switch off the central air conditioning you should have more exhaust or more suction into it. Then they said, no, no, it's not just the suction. You need to increase the filtration. You need to increase the number of air throws that happen and increase the number of um, HEPA filters. So more air, air, air throws to more filters and more suction. So do, these are, those are all the things which are there in the new ISHRE guidelines. So these are the things, rather than being sorry later, it's better to implement now, especially people who are wanting to start now. And if you've already started and if you're midway, one caution would be, if you go to the government right now and the DMHO, they'll ask you to give 50% bets for the COVID at the government cost. So just think about it as well. So these are my four <laughs> advices to you guys. I'd just like to add, based on what Satish said, yeah. The reminder is you don't need an expensive BMS or anything. Your even Google Gmail account has a calendar feature where you can put in reminders because oh, yes, yes. Yeah. If, remember, you are ultimately responsible. Your staff may have forgotten, but end of the day, you're responsible and it's always easier to renew a license before it expires than yes. after it expires. Yes. So you can do it through your system, your Gmail, this thing as well. But first you need to fill them up in the system. And it, it, you have to adjust it in such a way that it will give you an alert one month prior to that. Yes, sir. Yeah, the reason why I'm saying is it could be something simple like your overhead tank. So your overhead tank is due to be cleaned, you know. So those are the kind of things which if they alert you, then you can just, you know, uh, entrust it to somebody else to uh, do it quickly. Yeah, over to Prashant. Yes, sir. Even even if you if you are opening an hospital or if you open an hospital, even if you forget your wife's birthday, don't forget <laughs> the recommendations. <laughs> because birthday and wedding so, anniversary. Very no, badly. No. That itself is like I think that is <laughs> more <laughs> catastrophe. Wife is more catastrophe. <laughs> Prashant, I'll put that also in my Google calendar. <laughs> So uh, I think whether whether you remember, don't remember. If you want to, uh, uh, you know, put a tattoo on top of the dates of renewal, like Gajni in Amir Khan, 
do it make sure that it is done on time uh, because uh, especially when it relate when it is related to health i'm just trying to summarize what has been told by our speaker when it is related to health and emergency it's unpredictable and uh, any outbreak can happen any disaster can happen but you should be prepared uh, for the uh, disaster management so that that can only be done with preparedness and good uh, uh, following according to the books even if it is not possible to but do not forget once you are part of this uh, hospital or management where it's going to affect you and your team make sure that it is balanced uh, prevention is always better than cure and we as a doctors we know that better than anyone else so i would like to thank all my speakers wonderful speakers and the panelists who have been consistently giving their inputs we have been getting extremely good feedback there are many calls we have got who have designed their hospital with uh, without thinking and planning they are sending a message and saying that this particular webinar has redefined my thoughts as has made me think like an entrepreneur made me think like a businessman and i'm trying to redesign my hospital on the inputs which has been given and they are, they are extremely uh, um, thankful to all the panelists all the speakers and nnf karnataka and our uh, entire team headed by kotreshi sir and our president and kishor sir our vice president and our joint secretaries members thank you dr uh, nk yes, yes sir yes sir yes sir whatever yes, has explained and put it in beautiful slides i think that is like a bible for whoever you know you want to go with the permissions you can have it like about five or six or eight slides i think that is the you know beautiful he summarized it everything into a beautiful thing so whoever would want to start i think that is something fun i think we are we are planning to uh, record it and then have it on our website isn't it yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir it will be put in the website sir yes youtube channel as well as uh, the uh, our facebook uh, uh, page so thank you dr nkj sir dr ajay sir kishor sir dr suresh dr suresh sir dr satish ganta sir 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 all the panelists uh, and all the participants will continue this this is just the fourth uh, episode and already we are getting their life changing uh, lessons have been taught tips have been given thank you sir kishor sir would you like to uh, give a last comment before we close yeah. <laughs> thank you uh, especially the panelists uh, so satish ganta suresh and adarsh and all of you uh, you made uh, this uh, national program with your participation and experience of course uh, the legends from karnataka uh, nandakumar jayaram and ajay kumar with their huge experience and uh, success stories it was an eye opener for many of us hopefully lot more uh, people from all over india will learn uh, from the lessons and become doctor pruners and uh, do a success uh, story for us to showcase in future thank you very much potresh sir thank you kishor comment. kumar sir thank you sir kishor kumar sir it's all because of your blessings and your persistence too thank you thank you dinakar it goes to everyone who with the team work for nnf karnataka absolutely absolutely yes. Yes. thank you sir thank you thank you goodbye have a great evening thank you goodbye to all thank you thank you thank you one more question